Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today it's been a little bit quieter of a day for Tesla, but we do actually still have quite a few news stories to go through, particularly those related to Tesla Energy. But then we also have comments from the National Traffic Safety Board that we did not get to yesterday. Then we've got some news on the Model Y and quite a few other stories in the automotive industry. A little bit better day for the markets overall today. The Nasdaq finished up two tenths of a percent. Tesla outperforming, finishing up one and a quarter percent, $739.38 following the down day on Monday. As for tomorrow, just something to keep an eye out for from a macro level. Federal Reserve is having their two-day meeting right now. Their comments on that meeting will happen tomorrow, shortly before market close, a couple hours before market close. All right, so we've got a handful of Tesla energy stories here to start out with. First on Tesla's virtual power plant project in South Australia. Tesla's been working on this for a couple of years now. If you're not familiar, it's a network of 50,000 homes with power walls that are all virtually connected together then centrally controlled to help optimize distribution of energy. As we talked about when we went through Tesla's impact report, one of the underappreciated aspects of Tesla is their ability to utilize software to increase the utility of their hardware. And that's exactly what Tesla is doing with virtual power plants or VPPs. So the news that we have today on Tesla's South Australia VPP is coming from a senior manager of engineering at Tesla, sharing an update on LinkedIn. It reads, quote, Excited to launch the Tesla energy plan in my home state of Victoria today. The expansion of our virtual power plant from South Australia to Victoria allows customers with the Powerwall to participate in wholesale energy and frequency control markets, providing cheaper retail rates and supporting the power system when it's needed most. This is how we increase renewables penetration further from the 60% milestone we hit yesterday here in the national electricity market and accelerate the transition through the integration of renewables and storage at transmission level and the coordination of residential photovoltaic, battery storage, and EV charging as active distributed energy resources, end quote. So very exciting to see Tesla continue to expand on these virtual power plant programs. We also talked earlier about how Tesla is setting up a pilot program in California to do something similar. So the signs are there of Tesla being happy with the progress on the software side. And then on the hardware side, of course, Elon has talked about how they have just exorbitant number of Powerwall orders and really just want to get those ramped up as quickly as possible. And we have seen Powerwall sales increase dramatically over the last 18 months or so. My personal hope is that 4680 battery production unlocks sort of a step change in Powerwall production too, and projects like this can grow considerably. For a little bit more context on this specific VPP, South Australia, where the project currently is, has a population of about 1.8 million people. Victoria is about four times that size at 6.7 million. So who knows how many power walls there are there in Victoria. Tesla may have prioritized power wall deliveries into South Australia because of this virtual power plant program. But if not, could be a pretty sizable expansion. And unlike the test program that we talked about in California, which right now isn't offering any financial benefit to those customers, Tesla does market this particular project as benefiting from flexible time of use rates. So buying energy when it is cheap and then selling it back when it's more expensive. Tesla does work with a retail energy partner on this. So Energy Locals, for anyone in Australia that happens to know that, that's the company that Tesla is partnering with. So it's not 100% operated here by Tesla alone. Next, we've got an update on a utility scale energy storage project in New Mexico. This is from Energy Storage News via Clean Technica. New Mexico is looking to develop a 950 megawatt solar and storage facility that project now has a developer. The developer has closed financing and it will be using the Tesla Megapack. Looks like they are planning for 600 megawatt hours of battery storage for this project. It's expected to begin partial operation next June and be in full commercial operation sometime next fall. So 600 megawatt hours, that's a pretty big project. And as an upside, it is replacing a retiring coal plant there in New Mexico. Rounding out the energy news then, just kind of a fun update here from Tesla on Twitter. They have covered the Buffalo Heritage Carousel in New York with a solar roof. The carousel itself was built back in 1924. I guess technically this is the building that houses the carousel now. But from the video that Tesla shared, it looks really great. It's cool to see the solar roof in sort of an unusual setup like this. And of course, it would be tough to not appreciate such a well-implemented blend between new and old. All right, next we'll harshly transition from carousels to the NTSB, the National Traffic Safety Board, newly led by Jennifer Hammondy, who did an interview with the Wall Street Journal this weekend, expressing some concerns about, of course, Tesla. Hammondy believes that Tesla should not roll out their city streets driving features until they address what the NTSB views as safety deficiencies with the company's technology. Quote, basic safety issues have to be addressed before they're then expanding it to other city streets and other areas, end quote. 
She also believes that Tesla's use of the term full self-driving is misleading and irresponsible, saying, quote, it has clearly misled numerous people to misuse and abuse technology, end quote. So on that point, I've said before that I do actually think that there is some valid criticism for Tesla in terms of how they market full self-driving, but I don't think anyone actually using the technology has been misled. Like, it's super clear what it can do and what it can't do, especially even before the beta has been released. To me, that then falls into a communications problem, not a traffic safety problem. Hopefully that's what the data in the NHTSA investigation will support, but Hamadi is arguing that not taking regulatory action ahead of potential issues is, I guess, a poor strategy. She says, quote, doing investigations after the fact, that's a tombstone mentality. You can proactively address potential future crashes and future deaths by taking action, by issuing regulations, performance standards aimed at saving lives, end quote. I understand the spirit of the argument. I think it's a very poorly made argument, though. Doing investigations after the fact, you can't do investigations ahead of time. So I guess Hamandi would just prefer to go off of her gut feeling and, I guess, just arbitrarily make decisions based on that. Thankfully, NHTSA does have a much more defined process than that. It also insinuates that NHTSA hasn't been considering any of this stuff for a long time, which they have. They've had tons of correspondence with Tesla over the years. So if I were at NHTSA, I would be pretty annoyed by the insinuations that Hamidi is making here, which I suppose <laughs> if that is the case, if they are annoyed, then that could be a good thing because maybe they'll be a little bit less likely to consider Hamidi's comments in this area. The important thing to understand here is that the NTSB is more of an advisory board. They can make recommendations, but they don't have regulatory authority. NHTSA does. The NTSB can kind of push things in a certain direction, but ultimately NHTSA has the authority. The other thing that you may have seen related to the story is that Hamdi was actually a lobbyist legal representative for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, large union, for nine years beginning back in 1999. So a fair amount of commentary out there suggesting that maybe she's got an agenda against Tesla because of that history. And sure, it very well may, and it is good to understand that context. But I do also think it's a good opportunity to just kind of give a reminder that people should be judged on the basis of their argument, the quality of their argument, not necessarily their history or biases that they may or may not have, because that works the other way too. I get written off all the time just because I do a Tesla podcast. Anyway, in this case, I don't feel that the quality of the points that are being made is very high. Next, we've got a couple of regional updates on Tesla vehicles. First up, Drive Tesla Canada here reporting that the first deliveries of the refreshed Model S have now happened in Canada. There are two delivery reports so far, both long range Model S's, so no plaids yet, but probably soon. The other regional update then is that Tesla has opened the design studio for the Model Y in the UAE. The only available version right now is the long range version, estimated delivery 2022, and the price converts over to about 64,000 US dollars. Continuing on then, we've got a few more updates elsewhere in the automotive world. First up from Waymo, their head of behavior prediction will be speaking at the TEDx Mountain View on Thursday from 5.30 p.m. Pacific to 8 p.m. Pacific, sometime in that range, about how autonomously driven vehicles become experienced drivers. So it might be kind of interesting to check out. I'm not sure how in depth this presentation will be, but might give us a little bit of an opportunity to compare with Tesla's presentation at AI Day. Next, we've got a bit of an update on the chip shortage situation from GM's president, Mark Royce, which I think kind of re-emphasizes what we had talked about yesterday in terms of Intel and Qualcomm's comments about there just being a little bit of conflict in terms of the correct go-forward strategy for chip makers in the face of this shortage, with chip makers being a little bit hesitant to invest in older technology. Anyway, Mark Royce here saying that, quote, we're going to see a stabilization to some extent before we see getting the volume we really need, end quote. So the tone right now for most automakers to me seems to be that the situation is going to be improving here heading into the end of the year, but then it's not like you just get into 2022 and the chip shortage is resolved. Next story here is not really all that important, but it's just dripping with too much irony to not talk about. And that is a recall on the Ford Mustang Mach-E in Canada. So just for some context here, last year, Ford's global director of battery electric vehicles made some thinly veiled and disparaging comments towards Tesla, opining that up until that point, buyers of electric vehicles had had to deal with certain flaws in EVs, but said that about Ford, quote, the doors fit properly, the plastics and other materials color match, the bumpers don't fall off, the roof doesn't come off when you wash it, the door handles don't get stuck in cold weather, unquote. Fast forward less than a year, and this recall reads, quote, 
On certain vehicles, the glass panel of the panoramic roof may not be properly attached. Over time, the glass could become loose and separate from the vehicle. End quote. It's the automotive business. Recalls happen, but you've got to kind of chuckle at those words coming back so directly. Finally, then, a couple of pieces of news on new electric vehicles. First with Mercedes. Mercedes has announced the starting prices for various trims of the EQS in the United States. The EQS will start at $102,000, and then there are various trim packages, and those can run up to $125,000. I don't know if those are inclusive of all options then, but that's how the price range is looking now. As a reminder, the EQS has a WLTP test cycle range of 784 kilometers, 487 miles. No EPA test yet. Obviously, we'd want to know that range, but I think it should come in above 400 miles. So yeah, it's expensive. Probably not going to be competitive necessarily with the specs of a Model S, but Certainly there are some people that are just going to want a Mercedes and hopefully this can be a good option for them. The other new vehicle then is the Audi Q4 e-tron that's got an 82 kilowatt hour battery, but a very poor 241 mile EPA estimated range for that size battery and a $45,000 starting price. So first, I think probably not a lot of margin there for Audi and a decent price for customers, but not really the best value proposition. So that is it for today then. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow for the Wednesday, September 22nd episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.